straining through a sheer toga, showed more surprise than her eyes. Then, eager to please as nymphs usually are, she smiled sensually and purred in the only way she knew. Yes, of course, you're right. You say such clever things. She giggled. Draupadi stared at the creature for a moment before sighing again. There was no point getting angry at her. After all, nymphs hadn't exactly been created for conversational purposes. She turned away and began to walk towards her celestial quarters. The clouds beneath her feet felt fluffy and slightly wet, like rabbit fur flecked with early morning dew. Draupadi had quite enjoyed the constant tickling against her soles when she first arrived in heaven. Now, she often tried to remember what a stone floor or a muddy earth had felt like when she was alive. Alive. What an appropriate word to describe the mortal experience. She remembered a moment a long, long time ago when, as a girl, she had submerged herself underwater and she, until she felt faint and then broken through the surface with long gulps of air. Never had she felt more grateful for the invisible sustenance of mere breath. That was mortal life where the constancy of pain, want, and sorrow made the fleeting moments of pleasure, abundance, and joy that much more meaningful, where all one's senses were forced to engage, to adapt, to conquer, to prevail, to be useful, where the more one's body was punished by injury and age, the more one's mind was rewarded with wisdom and perspective where the complexity of relationships was so much vaster than the physical bounds in which they existed or the purposes they served. That had been her life once, when she had been alive, a long, long time ago. Draupadi sighed yet again. This was becoming a habit, she thought, and shook her head in a vain effort to cast off her gloomy mood. As she passed by the gates of heaven, she stopped to look at the two new arrivals who were making their way inside with odd looks on their faces. Very few came in these days, mostly crumpled old men with shaven heads and flowing ochre robes who chanted a lot of gibberish and always had an irritating smile on their faces. For some strange reason, they all seemed to be called Lama. She considered the two men. Draupadi usually never spoke to new arrivals, but perhaps her mood would lighten if she talked about the mortal world with those who had only just arrived from there. She walked up to the men, who huddled together as they saw her approach. Be at ease, old men, she commanded. I am Draupadi, queen of the Kurus, wife of the great Pandavas, Yudhishthir, Bhim, Arjun, Nakul, and Sehdi, who ruled Indraprastha and Hastinapur and brought forth a golden age in the mortal world by vanquishing the evil followers. She smiled grandly. The two old men stared back at Draupadi, bewildered. It was apparent from their expression that they had no idea what she was talking about. You know not of me? Draupadi's eyes widened. Do mortals not sing about the valor of my husbands in battle and of my beauty and grace? Do they still not worship us as the children of gods? The men looked at each other and then back at her. They shook their heads with trepidation and said, Excuse us, sister. We are monks and we only worship the Buddha. Buddha? I have never met him. What is he the god of? Asked Draupadi. Sister, Buddha is not a god. He was a simple man, said a monk. A man? Draupadi was confused. Then why do you worship him? Did he have special powers? Like the ability to fly or turn rocks into gold nuggets? No. We worship him because he attained inner bliss. And the other monk? He achieved true happiness. Draupadi blinked. You worship a man because he was happy. Yes. Truly happy all the time. And so are we. That's why we were allowed into the heaven too. They grinned at her before performing a few jerky bows and then proceeded on their way. Draupadi was bemused to say the least as she watched them leave. Heavenly standards had suddenly gone up if one needed to be truly happy all the time to get in. 
they were probably scared of overcrowding. She couldn't remember the last time she'd been even a little truly happy. And her mood plummeted again. <sighs> so much for talking to formal models, she thought, and stomped towards her chambers. Thank you, Richard. It sounds awesome in your voice. It really does. Uh, I'm going to read a passage now from the book, and I'm just going to set it up a little bit for you. So the four women have arrived in Delhi, and they've met a very nice man called Zafar, and Zafar is taking them out for lunch. So this is lunch. Well, real food is relative, supposed Rokhidi. The contents of her brightly colored parchment parcels certainly didn't look like food. But judging from the crowds around her, noisily eating on tables with gusto from the same parcels, she concluded that it had to be edible. Back when she was alive, Draupadi thought, food inspired the eater and was treated with respect. The way it looked, felt and tasted and the effect it had on the body were all equally important. Palace food was served on gold platters. Each delicate creation topped with a dash of cardamom scented clarified butter or slivered nuts and was encased in its own gilded bowl. There were tender leafy vegetables tossed in mustard, fried root vegetables in buttery cream curries. There was goat, deer, boar or bird meat marinated in spices and cooked for hours over slow fires and then baked with fragrant rice or engulfed in unapologetically spicy gravy. The juiciest, sweetest of fruit was made into sweetmeats with velvety cow's milk, raw honey, butter and nuts. And sour or raw fruit was made into fresh tangy pickles that made tongues dance. Even villagers in her day enjoyed good food. Draupadi thought as she remembered eating hearty cooked lentils and onions fried in mustard oil with chilies, along with large thick rotis roasted over an open fire until their outsides blackened and became crusty, but the insides remained soft and raw. Every morsel, even a plain grain of rice or a humble berry, had flavor and personality. This was she made a face as she looked down at what seemed like a flat cow dung patty in between two pieces of soft dough. She looked over at Zafar and saw him gingerly dip the side of the dough into a tiny tub of red paste and tuck into it. He seemed to be enjoying it. She bit a little tentatively and chewed. And chewed. The, the dough dissolved tastelessly in her mouth while the meat at least that's what she hoped it was, remained obstinately behind, fighting a valiant battle against being masticated. Yes. This is very good, Amba coughed politely as she chewed. What is it? Zafar avoided looking at her, obviously embarrassed by his earlier gawping. It's a burger. Have you all never had one? He asked Kunti. Kunti, struggling with her own mouthful of belligerent burger, shook her head irritably. Draupadi could sense that she was getting overwhelmed by the noise and impatient to get to the orphanage. She didn't blame her. The noise and commotion inside the eating house was like being inside a birdhouse. Its relentless cacophony enveloping them like a blanket. It frazzled the nerves and saturated the senses. What was it with the noise level everywhere, she wondered. One didn't even get a break from it indoors. Gandhari hadn't touched her burger. She sat stoically staring at it before she spoke. What is it made from? Zafar smiled at her. Well, my guess is cardboard mostly, but they say it's bread and meat. In the rest of the world, they use beef, but that would never sell in India, so they say it's mutton. You can never be too sure, though. Are you vegetarian? Sorry, I didn't ask. I can get you something else if you like. Yes. Get me something else, said Gandhari haughtily, looking at her burger as if it was going to bite her instead. Zafar looked a bit surprised at the impolite tone, but immediately got up with a cheerful, show, sure, be right back. They waited until he was out of earshot before starting to speak. Draupadi said to Gandhari, 
it was rude to refuse to eat. He has been helpful, or at least he's trying. She gave her brother a disgusted look. Just eat the next thing he brings you. Gandhari looked distressed. Believe me, I would never refuse food as somebody's guest. It goes against everything I have been taught. But she gestured at her parcel in disgust. How can they eat this? Kunti looked up with a weary look in her eyes. I don't know. I don't recognize this world. It screams constantly. She held her head in her hands. My mind hurts and I feel like weeping. The only thing that keeps me going is that I will see my son soon. We must go. Stay strong, said Amba softly, putting an arm around Kunti's shoulders. We must remember that the mortal world is in Kalyuk and chaos is bound to be the norm. Before I went into battle, I was told to meditate, focus my mind on my goal and shut out all the noise. We must all try and do that now. Kunti nodded resolutely, just as Zafar re returned with a parcel containing almost exactly the same thing as before, but only the flat, dun-like thing in between the dough was a bright yellow color. He gestured at it before handing it to Gandhari and said, this one is vegetarian, aloo tikki. Gandhari nodded as if she knew what that meant, taking the parcel with a faint smile. Thank you. This is much better. Draupadi couldn't help but smile at the thought of Gandhari's imminent distress. But as pleasurable as it would be to watch her put away each bite, the sooner they ate, the sooner they could get out of there. So she picked up what was left of her burger, took a deep breath and a big bite. Now, we're going to launch the book. Can we give them a round of applause, please? Come on.